This program is part of American Graduate. Let's make it happen. A public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special town hall edition of Louisiana Public Square. I'm Shauna Sanford, anchor and reporter for LPB. And I'm Robert Travis Scott, president of the Public Affairs Research Council of Louisiana. Well, just over a year ago, our organization came out with a study of Louisiana's dropout rate, one of the highest in the nation, a future at risk. It analyzed the efforts the state is taking to keep students in school, as well as which programs seem to be working. Just in the time since we released our report, Louisiana's dropout rate has decreased by more than 2%. And that is good news, Robert. But even with the improvement, the state's graduation rate is still under 71%. The legislature has set a goal of an 80% graduation rate by 2014. So how will we get there? Well, tonight, we explore that question with the individuals on the front lines, teachers. They'll have the opportunity to share their opinions and pose questions to our panelists on how to best confront Louisiana's dropout dilemma. But first, a preview. By the time Louisiana's high school seniors donned their caps and gowns in 2011, nearly 15 percent of their fellow classmates had dropped out. According to the most recent state data, 14.6 percent of all Louisiana ninth graders didn't graduate with their class four years later, a measure of what's known as the cohort dropout rate. While the cohort dropout rate has improved by 2 percent since the 2010 school year, for Casey Goodson, an eighth grade teacher in Livingston Parish, keeping students in school is still a struggle. The greatest challenge is probably student apathy. They just don't see education as important and they see it as a hindrance to their lives. And I would want them to have the desire to go to school and see it as an opportunity. Angela Cotton, an eighth grade teacher in Concordia Parish, says the dropout problem really starts at home. Our biggest ally and who is hindering our progress is the same person. It's the parents. I feel like we need our parents to help encourage. And when they don't do that, then our kids don't feel like they have to graduate and they feel like they can drop out. Louisiana Superintendent of Education John White says the dropout problem is a complex one. There are a lot of challenges that our kids are facing today. A lot of those challenges stem from challenges that exist in home from the time that they're born. And anyone who sits here and says that poverty isn't a challenge in the learning of children or that it's easier to educate kids today than it was 20 or 40 or 50 years ago, just wrong. It's hard. The Louisiana legislature has set an 80 percent graduation rate goal for the state by 2014, a tall order considering the state's rate has been about 67 percent in recent years. The Department of Education has a total of 17 programs dedicated to improving high school graduation and dropout rates. These initiatives are being supplemented by projects such as Diplomas Now, a cooperative endeavor of education's Next Horizon, Communities in Schools, City Year, and Talent Development, a program of Johns Hopkins University. Sarah Ross is team leader for the City Year Corps at Broadmoor Middle, one of three Baton Rouge schools using the anti-dropout plan. We have talent development that pulls all the data, that knows everything about uh, the grades, so we can know the information that um, would be needed to, you know, do proper interventions. 
City Year Corps members then focus in on the at-risk students and start what's known as nag and nurture. The nag part could be like the constantly, like, are you going to class? You should be in class right now. Have you done your classwork? Did you do your homework? Um, those like little things. But the nurture part is when they get an A on their test, or when they get a B on their test even, to congratulate them, to let them know that we're there for them. When something's going wrong, if they're not doing their work in class, we want to know why. Maybe there's an issue going on at home. Social workers are also available to help with non-academic issues. Broadmoor Middle School has already seen its suspension rate drop from 50 to 15 percent. Choices is a new anti-dropout program being launched in Louisiana by Rotary International to give students a reality check of what's lost by leaving school. What we're really accomplishing for kids is helping give them a view into the future, a view into their future lives through the, through the person that's in there in the classroom to help them realize what they could become if they were to make some positive choices in their lives as well. Leo Muller is the executive director of Choices.org, which is based in Seattle. In partnership with Rotary, Choices hopes to reach 23,000 Louisiana students over the next year. The program, Muller says, connects with kids in ways that teachers and parents can't because it's taught by members of the local business community. Students will see them as, well, they're out in the real world. They know what it's really like. They're out there working and making a buck and, and trying to make it through life. Superintendent White says Choices aligns well with another initiative his department is pursuing called Course Choice. That program basically says to industry, apply educate. We'll give you the funding through our core funding formula to educate our kids, but we need you, industry, to prepare our kids for the next generation. No matter which approach is used to keep students on track towards a high school diploma, it all begins with the intervention of a caring adult like Destiny Cooper, a 12th grade teacher in Baton Rouge. She says one of her students just quit coming to classes after he witnessed a friend's murder. I went immediately to administration. And they cared enough to, to say, wait a minute, he's not going to anybody's class. Let's get the support system going. And that's when we got mom involved, and that's when we got the guidance counselors involved. And that's when we saw Jordan walk across the stage. And we want to thank Sue Lincoln with the Southern Education Desk for helping us put that story together. As you can see, we have a great audience with us tonight. We have teachers and others who are on the front line who deal with this very important subject day in and day out. But before we get to our audience members tonight, I'd like to take a few moments to introduce you to our panelists. We have a very distinguished group of panelists with us tonight. And we start with Ken Bradford, who is the Assistant Superintendent with the Department of Education's Office of Content. He is currently currently implementing two programs aimed at improving high school graduation and dropout rates. Dr. Cecile Gouin is the director of the Office of Social Service Research and Development with LSU's School of Social Work. She oversees the state's 12 truancy centers that provide intervention for young students at risk of dropping out of school. Seated next to her is Steve Monahan. He's a former teacher and currently president of the Louisiana Federation of Teachers, which represents both teachers and school personnel. And John Warner Smith is founder and CEO of Education's Next Horizon, a statewide not-for-profit dedicated to supporting reforms in public education. It is wonderful to have you all here with us tonight uh, to talk about something that I know you all are very passionate about. And we have a room full of folks who are equally as passionate about it. So we're in for a great discussion tonight. Before we take questions from our audience, though, to each of you, I'd like to know your thoughts about this 80% graduation rate that uh, the state uh, has set for, uh, the legislature rather, has set for Louisiana to reach by 2014. Should we be optimistic that, in fact, we're going to reach that goal? And Ken, I'll start with you. I think we should be very optimistic about the goal. Since 2007, the state cohort graduation rate has increased from 65% uh, to 71%, approximately 71%. And we don't see right now any reason that the momentum is not going to keep going. Dr. Gouin? Well, obviously, we've made great strides over the last few years in, in doing something about our dropout rate. And I think if we keep the programs in place and the other services in place that have supported uh, that type of improvement, that we can make it. Steve. Well, I think we should be realistic about the goal. And by that I mean the, uh, celebrate the progress that Louisiana has made. Any progress is good. But 
it, essentially, let's be honest, politicians set goals. Educators have to implement the goals that are set, and that means you have to align your resources and your commitment to those goals. Mm -hmm. Really, really, I mean, realistically, and I think that's the problem right now, and that's disconnect. So, I, I, I mean, pragmatically, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, yeah, we can reach those goals, but we can also push them back, or we can claim we have without really having done so. John, what's your take on this? I, I would agree that uh, the, the goal has helped um, energize districts, um, school leaders, as well as the policymakers who develop the programs that. Uh, uh, that are funded to support our students. Um, Eighty percent, I think, is a, it's a good target, and um, the state is uh, may not reach eighty percent uh, by the target date, but I think we've certainly made some progress, and we'll continue to make progress uh, okay. in the next year or two. Okay, well, it's a great uh, uh, place to uh, start our discussion, and I want to begin tonight with uh, Mr. Milton Adams. It is great to have you here tonight to be a part of this discussion. You have. You have an incredible story, and um, I'd love for you to share your story. You uh, had to really push and push and push uh, to continue your education uh, as a result of Hurricane Katrina. Tell us very briefly what happened. Okay, my name is Milton Adams, and I'm from New Orleans. I'm a Hurricane Katrina survivor. What I went through with Katrina was, uh, it was like a little bit devastated on me continuing my education as into going from here, going to there, going from there, going to here. So as what I've done for me being displaced from Katrina, when I moved to uh, La Place area, which is La Place, Louisiana, and I had went ahead over there, was going to school, and when I failed the leap test about like 20 points, my nana, she uh, pushed me into this uh, adult GD program, which was called like One Stop, and I was going to that. Had a little complications with me going to that because it was like transportation issues with that. And uh, what was done with that, I moved to something else, which is now I'm into uh, this good school program. In, it's called the American Academy online courses where you can work from home, be persistent on your education, and drive forward and go forward with that. What do you all make, thank you so much for sharing your story, what do you all make of just the struggle that he had to go through in order to get to the point where he could get his GED? Should he have had to go through all of that, John? Well, I think um, it, it's not a typical so situation, but it, it does speak to the, the, the barriers and the challenges that many of our students face. Um, and we look at, um, at, at these kids uh, as dropouts, uh, oftentimes looking on the surface of things. and. I mean, your situation is, is certainly, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great story to tell. You, uh, you are now working to get your GED mm -hmm. to, to come back into the system. You are back into the system. We have many kids, you know, when you talk about the dropout problem, um, they, they, and, and you ask, um, well, why did you drop out? Uh, well, some may have reasons similar to yours. Some may say, uh, well, uh, I, I'm just bored. I lost interest in school. I don't want to go to school anymore. Some may say, well, I had family uh, challenges. I, I got pregnant, uh, peer pressure. Uh, these are, in my opinion, uh, personal and individual reasons, but they really just kind of touch the surface of things. And I'd like to talk a little more in depth when we have some time about what I would call these um, institutional challenges that many of our kids face particularly uh, children in, in, in who have experienced poverty, who have experienced the kinds of challenges you've experienced, because they bring all that to the table, and, and we have to deal with it in a different context. Well, he's currently involved in uh, the No Dropouts program, which is an online-based curriculum uh, for students uh, in a, a similar situation. Ken, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the online program, because, in fact, you're working on implementing a couple of programs uh. similar to this. Certainly with the online learning in, in this day and age, that, that can be a tool for students out there in the field to use to uh, achieve their coursework. In Louisiana right now, th there's approximately uh, 10,000 students uh, across the state that are taking courses on a daily basis uh, to supplement their curriculum and, and course needs. Uh, there's positive results, demonstrated results for those students that are doing that. And so by empowering the teachers and the students and the parents and the local school systems with all these tools that are available out there, 
uh, in providing them access to that. You can have customized plans for students so that every student will have that customized pathway. And if they need an online course, that's good. If they need a face-to-face uh, -face course in a brick and mortar school, that's great. If they need uh, to be more challenged, if, if you're a student that it is accelerating and you need more rigor, perhaps as an advanced placement course or a dual enrollment course opportunity for you that you can take online through either a state virtual school program, through a local district program, or through a third party program. Uh, I think that given the, 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 with the exception of the factor that we had Katrina involved, I don't think the Mr. Milton's story is all that unusual. I think unfortunately in Louisiana, and that's the, I think it begins, it begins with an honest discussion about Louisiana. We're a high poverty state. And that means what I think we really have to do. And I think online, the online component is, is, is interesting. But I think there is also a need for a real human touch in all of this. There are human beings in classrooms that have to be touched by people. And they have to be treated like people. And that doesn't start at the high school level. It starts at identification of at-risk children very early in life. I mean, most studies will point to that. I also feel that I, I find really very sad is that we're missing the point here. We're not connecting the dots. There are dots to connect between school and home and community. The idea that poverty doesn't touch Mr. Milton in the circumstances that, that occurred out of Katrina when we realized that in Katrina, with the storm, the poor were much more profoundly affected than those with more resources. Mm -hmm. So I, I really believe the honest conversation, and I believe it's it might be politically incorrect in some cases, but we cannot divorce the funding we put into programs. I, I, I flinched when I heard Mr. Milton say that he had a transportation problem. He had a transportation problem to do what he's trying to do. Right. And I think those are the kind of conversations that have to occur if we're going to get beyond the platitudes of what we're trying to do and actually make real change in Louisiana happen. Well, you talk about the high poverty rate, you talk about the transportation issues, the online component is great, but what about the resources and the accessibility of the online component to students who are similar to, to those who are living in poverty, who are struggling, who perhaps are just as, uh, you know, have just as much passion about an education as Mr. Milton, but cannot access the system? Yes. Well. Um we launched uh, Louisiana's Promise several years ago um, with uh, the support, in fact, of LPB. And you know, one of the things we um, we advocate with with this dropout prevention initiative is that there be community engagement. Community leaders and school leaders have to talk, and we encourage um, uh, community organizations, businesses law enforcement officials, judicial officials, and others uh, to really sit with our school leaders and number one, really try to understand why children are dropping out in their community. Secondly, work together to develop an action plan, uh, again, working in partnership with schools and community leaders, develop a plan that's going to address the problem and, and develop strategies that will sustain the problem. And if you go sustain that effort, if you go through that process, you'll uncover stories like this one and, and you'll address barriers and obstacles that are preventing uh, children in those communities from, you know, from, uh, from graduating. Robert, I know you have somebody who wants to get in on the conversation. Well, yes, let's let, let the teachers uh, have <laughs> a say. And uh, we have here with us Samantha Young, who is a teacher at East Ascension Parish uh, high school and my first question for you Samantha do you love your job I do I love what I do that's great I'm glad to hear that now you work uh, with a program uh, in which you are a graduation coach is that right yes sir tell us a little bit about that um, well my colleague uh, Lacey Barbera and I we work with um, East Ascension High School students who are at risk for dropping out um, our students are on what's called a career diploma and we track those students very closely, grades, behavior, attendance, and um, we are also mentors to those students. So we, re we frequently pull them out of class um, just for a quick, hey, how's it going? These are your grades. Do you realize you, or even, in, even means copying work for them or whatever it is that we have to do to get them um, passing. We also do interventions with um, kids who are struggling if they're having trouble with um, courses or with teachers or other home issues. Uh, we make a lot of contact with parents, so we're kind of in, 
in, in our minds, we see us as a, as a way of bridging some of the gaps that have been there. Um, we're, we're kind of a liaison for the teacher as well. So we, we have a huge network that we kind of work with to try to help um, build those relationships. And I know you have a question for the panel, but what do you think is the toughest challenge in, in trying to make this graduation rate increase? Well, I think um, the gentleman on the end um, really hit on some very, um, very important issues with um, targeting students before they come to high school because we have kids that come to high school who are so far behind um, and we're supposed to fix it. Uh, but we don't have a lot of the same programs that they have at the elementary and the middle school of like social promotion and, and those kinds of things. When you come to high school, you have to get the credits. There's just no way around that. You have to pass the class. Um, and if you're reading on a first grade level, which I have students that I teach that read on a first grade level and I'm expected to teach them to pass an EOC for 10th grade English, that is quite challenging. And I think I'm a great teacher but I'm not superwoman, so. <laughs> now you have a, you have a question uh, for the, the panelists. I guess my um, question really comes from my position as a graduation coach, and um, one way we motivate students is promoting these um, programs where they can get tr a career and technical training while they're in high school. Um, but the problem comes in when our schools are going to be penalized financially for that because we're going to be sending them to another campus for part of a day or whatever. So how, how do we fix that? So the program that you're alluding to, is, is, are you alluding to the course choice program? <clears throat> so certainly. So w starting next year, in, in, in next school year, in the 2013 school year, students in Louisiana will have access to the course choice program. And as Superintendent White alluded to in, in the introduction this evening, that's going to be a program where business and industry, school systems, teachers themselves, and external pro course providers, online providers, uh, can go through a very rigorous uh, application process to apply to be a course provider for the next school year on a course basis. Students in Louisiana that attend a CD or an F school will be eligible to take courses through a catalog. Uh, students at an A and B school will be eligible to take courses that are otherwise not available to them at their existing A and B school. Uh, the statute states that up to one-sixth of 90 percent of the school district's MFP uh, could follow the student to the provider. So every provider in the application process is submitting a tuition bid um, for the student, and that's the ceiling, the one-sixth of a 90 percent. Um, it's not expected that many of them will come in at the full ceiling amount. But it's important to note that in, also in statute is that a school district retains 10 percent of the cost of the 10 percent of the student's MFP for administrative and operational costs, as well as they retain uh, the cost for one course, because the statute says that every student at a CDRF school must still take at least one course back at their base school. So 25% of the MFP is remaining at the school, and then the student will, will be able to go to the <coughs> course choice program if they choose, if there's a course that they need uh, to come into the course choice program and select courses that would be applicable to them for their college and career pathway. Mr. Monahan, do you want to try to answer a question as well, maybe from a different perspective? Oh, I definitely have a different perspective. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think you, can, you can nobly and, and uh, reasonably disagree. Uh, and I think I will begin by saying that uh, it was perhaps with, with very fine intentions that the law in which we're, we've been discussing here was passed. But it's a badly flawed piece of legislation. And here, I'll, I'll tell you why. You're one coach. The problem is larger than you are. The individuals you're working with aren't inanimate objects that you pick up and carry somewhere. There are human beings that need maybe more coaches. And the truth of this whole dilemma we're in is for four straight years, we have frozen funding for the Minimum Foundation Program. Four straight years. There are consequences for that decision. And one of the consequences is, as you bleed money or the state bleeds money away from the schools, the coaches are going to be running around with their whistles. And there are going to be more players that they're going to have to try to coach than are able to reach with the resources they have. So I think there needs to be some legislative correction here. And that's where I can really get passionate because I don't think we had to make the mistake. We didn't have to compound a mistake. Uh, and that, that state funding formula, I guess, was frozen on a per student. Uh, basis for the last four years. Last four years. Referring to. Uh, Samantha, did they adequately answer your question and do you want to hand out any grades? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I won't give any grades tonight, but I think that um, both sides present, I mean, plausible arguments. I, 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 as a graduation coach, I do, con I am concerned about the students' um, needs as well as my own as a professional and um, other graduation coaches because um, just this year I was hired originally for the position but the number of students almost doubled at our campus coming from middle school so we hired a second graduation coach um, and um, you know we work very very hard to do what we do and we we I mean from what it looks um, it's going to continue to grow exponentially and if that if it continues to grow at that rate um, everybody's gonna be a graduation coach I don't know well, where we're gonna yeah, and, <laughs> have a teacher you know? right. well thanks to both of you we really appreciate your your valuable work and your hard work you. you know there are so many programs that are trying to address dropouts and I know Shauna uh, wants to talk to a gentleman over here who has yet another uh, way of going at this. That's right. Thank you so much, Robert. Yes, Mark LaCour, thank you so much for being here tonight. You're with the Rotary Club, and you all do have a program to address the dropout rate. Tell us just a little bit about it. Yes, Sean. Uh, we started uh, July 1st uh, promoting a, a program called Choices. It started in Seattle, where a father was having trouble with their son just being true and not even going to school. They couldn't talk to each other, so we started writing them life lessons, and basically the lessons are your choices you make have consequences. Very simple. And in 26 years, he's uh, promoted that or given that course to eighth graders uh, around the country in Canada. And basically, it's business people getting involved, just like John mentioned a minute ago, that w the business community get involved. When we get in the classroom, we say, I'm Mark LaCour. I'm a furniture man. Tell them a little bit about what I do. I'm not a teacher. I'm here because I care. And that's the whole thing. You get started right there, and you go into teaching them about about uh, factors that control their lives, about uh, money management, uh, uh, self uh, discipline, and they get take homes that that remind them of the lessons they've learned. Tell us uh, your question. You have a question. Okay, I have a yes. question. <laughs> you know when, when to stop. What do you think is the role and responsibility of the business community in helping our children graduate from high school? John, why don't you take that one? Well. Um, the business community um, can do a number of things. Um, first of all, you can support schools and support teachers. Um, and you oftentimes, uh, I, I talk to superintendents all the time, and, and you know, they, they, they see the challenges, they're, they're trying to graduate more kids. Um, revenues are tight, state funding is limited, and, and local funding oftentimes is even more limited. Um, and, and I know that uh, the business community has a job to do of its own. And, and you're there to support um, the community as best you can. But, but, but I think that's number one, support schools and support the community. Now, in terms of directly helping kids, uh, their internship opportunities, job shadowing, career fairs, um, things that can be done in partnership with schools to help kids to become more aware, more knowledgeable about the high growth, high demand careers, um, both within that community and that region and, and beyond, um, and, and to work with the, the, the higher education system, and again, in partnership with, with schools, um, to help build skills, uh, industry-based skills. Uh, I promote work keys as a as a, a, a great tool that uh, that we can use uh, in Louisiana. We can certainly do do more in that area uh, to help to better prepare our kids um, for uh, careers and for for post secondary uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, Dr. Gouin, I'd like to bring you in on this discussion because it seems like there are a lot of programs out there. Um, but there's still something that's missing because we still have a serious yeah, problem. I can tell so you exactly what is that? What's missing? What's missing? From listening to all this. Um, and by the way, I've never been this quiet for this long in my entire <laughs> life. So <laughs> I've been saving up. Um, I agree with almost everything everybody said, um, but we're talking about programs and business and all of the and what the school sh board should be doing. But nobody's talking about what is the cause of the problem because if you don't have the pro if you don't have the services and the programs directed to the research and the evidence and farm practices it does no good and so uh, a lot of times we have wonderful programs but it's it's directed at the wrong prop 
problem. Uh, for example, when Mr. Milton was talking, I, I thought, what a remarkable guy. That, you know, he had those problems, and at his stage in the school system, he still continued to try to work through those problems. I didn't think it was a usual story at all. People, I, I mean, the children I'm uh, familiar with that have those types of problems at his age would have been goners. When the, uh, she, the teacher was talking about the barriers, when you talk about teachers going through those kind of barriers year after year after year after year, you know, they're not, they don't continue to be real engaged with the school system. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is critical to understand that the, the pathway to drop out of school starts in early childhood. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't, in my opinion, put the majority of your resources into early childhood, then you're just waiting until you have to pay more and more and more and more. Every drop of research, academic research that you read will tell you that if you don't get children, if the school system can't get children engaged in school in the first and second grade, they, they stand a great loss of losing those children. By the fourth grade, if a child is not engaged in school, the chance of them ever graduating is, is greatly reduced. Um, we just finished doing a study um, on the difference between dropouts and graduates in Louisiana, uh, thanks to the Department of Education sharing their data with us. And uh, we found that uh, for the period of time we study that 20% um, of the children that um, went to the Department of Corrections, 20% of the people that went into the Department of Corrections had, um, had dropped out of school compared to 3% of graduates who had gone to the Department of Corrections. And then when you talk about saving money, which nobody's talked about yet, um, even you saw a difference then between graduates and dropouts because gra graduates had gotten in trouble still tended to stay on probation and in community-based services, whereas those who had dropped out of school were in prison on parole things that cost a lot more to our, our state. Well, you know, it begs the question, if that's what the research clearly shows, then why aren't our efforts all directed in that direction? Why are we not focused on the early childhood intervention? Steve, you're smiling brightly yeah, over there. <laughs> yeah, I am, Sean, because I've heard the question asked far too many times. Uh, it's not, in this case, brain surgery. Uh, everyone knows, and everyone has always known, that where you have to address the problem is at the earliest possible point. And we have to address it with the, in the whole construct that there is a problem with resources, and that could be family resources. It could be the fact that there is a, a shattered home. Those are all real, and they're, in, in, and they're infectious in communities. So I, I think it starts there. I think what has happened throughout the history of our state is that you, you hear people speak of in the good times, and in the good, bad times, and the tight times, and for most educators, it's good times have never really arrived. Uh, the struggles have gotten worse, but the investment other than the words and the mantras that go along with the, whatever the political agenda is, it seems to be the same. Why we cannot do it, why we have to do it on the cheap, but we do make, and I'll end here because I can go real deep into this stuff. We are easily, we say too often that we want world-class schools and we want every child to have equal opportunity to learn. But then everyone runs for shelter when we talk about how we're gonna get there. The investment has to be made and it has to be understood in the context of the state we live. And that means policies have to be aligned with the goals. That's it, if you want a, a Taj Mahal, you invest in a Taj Mahal. If you want something different, and I, where I will end here, we make choices. It's not a question of whether we have the resources. It's a question of what the priorities of the state and the communities are. We can make the right choices or we can continue what we're doing now. Okay, I wanna bring up a graphic here and I'd love to get your uh, take on this and, and hear from our teachers as well on this. The LSU Public Policy Research Lab conducted a survey specifically on tonight's topic and when asked when children should be targeted with anti-dropout programs, here were the top three answers that were given. 51% of those surveyed said elementary school, 39% of those said middle school, junior high, and 6% of those said high school. Were they right about that? John? It's important that we start early. And if we start early enough, as Cecile and Steve have both said, um, then kids will enter kindergarten ready to learn, 
Um, they will be proficient in, in reading as we need them to be literate uh, by third grade. They will, they will enter fourth grade on time and, and they'll have an enriching experience in middle school. But if we, if we don't do that, then, then we're compounding the problem. Then we're, we're, we're really just putting Band-Aid on, a, on a, a, a very deep wound. But um, until we catch up, and Louisiana is on its way with the passage of Act Three, we have to focus uh, very intensely on, um, on middle schools. And um, we, uh, I see Patrick standing here, who's going to be asking a question, maybe it's about this, but uh, our, our Diplomas Now uh, program does just that in two middle schools in, here in East Baton Rouge in partnership with uh, Communities and Schools City Year in Talent Development of Johns Hopkins University. Um, you, you, you take the time with a team of, um, of uh, partners and, and look at those risk factors. And, and they're staring us, at us all the time. Poor behavior, poor attendance, poor academic performance, emotional issues. When we see these signs in middle school children, we have to act quickly, step in, and provide targeted intervention to address them. If we do not, these, these children will end up more than likely, uh, if, if not retained in, in, at, at some grade in middle school, entering ninth grade mm -hmm. with the same problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would certainly agree that uh, we need to focus on the early years uh, and have an early warning system, a, a very sophisticated early warning system at the very latest in those middle schools. You mentioned Patrick, so we're going to toss it over to Robert and Patrick. Well, that's right. And whenever we talk about uh, the dropout rate or the graduation rate, it always gets intertwined in this issue about the challenges the student faces, not only in the classroom, but in the rest of their life. And we have here with us Patrick uh, Gensler, who uh, is a social worker in uh, a middle school. Now, you're involved with a program called Diplomas Now? Correct. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit uh, about that and about what you do at the, in the middle school. Sure. Um, it's a collaboration between several different agencies. And the whole idea was um, Johns Hopkins researchers got together and realized that there are a bunch of different programs out there, all focused on tackling this dropout crisis. Um, but each program has its different strengths. So they decided to kind of group some of them together. Um, we have um, talent development, which is the John Hopkins program, which fo focuses on curriculum changes, um, whole school climate, that kind of thing, and also intensive supports for teachers and staff. Um, city year, and the people with the red jackets and red vests. You see them in schools every day working with students, providing near peer mentoring relationships, and actually modeling relationships for students that they might not get elsewhere. And then um, communities and schools, um, we assign a site coordinator to each school, and that site coordinator acts as kind of a liaison between the community and the school, and also provides um, intense case management for those students who are faced with events in their lives that might be outside of the focus of those interventions that are already in place, such as loss of a loved one, or incarceration, or death of a parent, or um, even family disruptions, or disruptions to your living environment. So well, from that standpoint, I know you have a question for the panelists, and uh, I wonder yes. if you go ahead with that. And, um, as a social worker, aside from the things I do on a day-to-day -day, day -to -day basis um, in terms of counseling with students, um, I also provide a lot of brokering of services for students and get community resources inside the school to address whole school needs. Um, and many of you already touched on this, but I want to ask, I, mean, I want to get an answer from at least two of you. Um, how important is the community and how important are community, community partners in keeping kids in school? and on track to graduate. How about Dr. Gowen for that one? That's, that was a, um, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, our, our task program, our truancy program uh, that LSU uh, evaluates is aimed at zero through fifth grade, primarily because of economic reasons when we got the money from the uh, state. But um, when we developed the model, we, we went around with retired Senator, Senator Chris Ulo from Jefferson Parish. We went all over the state with the legislative subcommittee and we interviewed and had uh, hearings, public hearings on what the teachers needed, what the schools needed to have assistance. I mean, what, what could we put in place that would help them deal with all these social service, I mean, social problems that the children's faced. And so our model was developed 
uh, exactly on the feedback that we got from all the communities across the state. And one of the things that the communities consistently said was that it had to be a team approach. You couldn't dump everything on the teachers. You can't dump everything on the school system. It has to be everybody involved. And, and thus we developed the task model where it's based on a, a, a community advisory board uh, that monitors uh, the program and, and helps uh, keep the structure of the program. But it's, it's heavily focused on having that task case manager deal with the school social worker and deal with the people in the school so that one person is not stuck with a, a million problems that they're overwhelmed by. Our, last year our school did a survey uh, in conjunction with a project with the Department of Education uh, to see exactly what the role and the function of school social workers are in the state at this time. And social workers did everything probably from mopping the floor to you know, crisis intervention, to helping teachers, to sitting with coaches, I mean, everything you could think of. And it, yeah, <laughs> yes, everything. And, and, and the problem is we definitely need more so, uh, social workers in schools, and we have to have the community assistance from Rotary and from uh, Kids Hope and different programs like that to assist. Now, there was one other person you wanted to answer this question. Who might that be? Um, Let's go with John. <laughs> <laughs> That's a safe choice. <laughs> Patrick does a great job with us. Uh, we uh, certainly appreciate his service. Um, I, I'll, uh, I want to really kind of talk about it in a different context. I think, I think we would all agree that it's important, that community partnerships are important. Uh, but the, the challenges that schools have, and we have, uh, we're different. In, in Broadmoor and Bel Air uh, and Capitol Mill, we've got uh, we've got a team of folks there, you know, with the with the national partners, uh, working with the at-risk at kids and reaching out into the community to bring the resources that are needed. Most schools in Louisiana just don't have those resources, and so the challenge for and, I, and I'll offer this challenge to our policymakers that we when we have models like that, we need to build on them. We need to figure out a way to expand them. And um, we're trying to do that here in East Baton Rouge, but you know, principals uh, and even graduation coaches really don't have time in the day to reach out um, into a community and try to connect these kinds of dots. So as we, as we go forward and try to address this problem, we should be looking at models like diplomas now and, and build on them, expand them, uh, to support schools in ways that they, they can bring these resources into the schools. But, but I wonder, you know, some people, uh, Mr. Bradford, uh, might say, golly, is, is it really our job to take care of everything through the school system? Uh, is, that, is, that the, is that the answer? Or I mean, some people think we're doing too much. Yeah, certainly. So l let me speak to the community first. And, and, you know, speaking with the community, part of your community are the businesses in your community. And so, as we alluded to earlier, you know, we've invited businesses into the course choice program. Um, and so, they'll be able to come in, they'll be able to assist in offering courses. And, and it even ties back to what we talked about with the graduation coach uh, in, in reference to the career diploma. You know, students in middle school now, they sit down, they're, they're doing individual graduation plans, they're mapping out a, a, a college and or career path through, through the career diploma, and they're, they're taking a series of coursework that will lead to industry-based certifications. We've invited business and industry to come in, offer some of your courses, make these available to students, provide internship opportunities, et cetera, lead to, lead to industry-based certifications so that students can graduate, they'll be job ready, and, and so, so we, we feel very, very strongly that yes, community is very, very important. And you important. feel like yeah, that type of program can help overcome some of these social challenges. That's, that's what you're saying. So. Uh, certainly, and, and, and I think that pro programs like this where students will start on a, a, a diploma pathway or a career pathway where they're engaged, and whether it's engaged mm -hmm. in a pathway where they know that the end game is they might be in a community where there's strong uh, petrochemical industry, or they may be in a community where there's, there's, a, there's another need for uh, allied health fields. And so now we can have these targeted programs in these communities, and students will have access to them, and they'll have internship opportunities and lead to industry-based Basically, new ways of lighting the path uh, for them that, to that, go, that's go correct. forward. Uh, let's pause just for a moment to uh, take a look at one of our surveys uh, that 
we conducted, LSU's Public Policy Research Lab conducted this survey of Louisiana residents uh, about tonight's topic. And when asked to choose what uh, would do the most to increase public high school graduation rates, the top three answers were uh, involving the parents. That was given uh, as an answer by 33% of respondents. Offering more career track diplomas was given an answer by 17% of respondents. And enhance the connection between school and employment was given by 13% uh, of, re of respondents. Uh, I think that's a very interesting survey. However, as far as a policy directive, it seems like that's not the direction we're following in regard to what the public says it would like to see happen to improve our high schools. We're going in a totally different di direction. We're dancing in the margins with the devil, so to, so to speak, here. We're, we're addressing things like evaluation, which are very important, but it's not being identified as the top problem in our schools right now. It's, we're not addressing what the public says the problems are, and I think that's why we're going to see some, some reflection and correction as we move forward. Well, how do we get back on track here? Right. I mean, because, and I don't, want, I don't want you all to skip over this, the point that was made about parent, parental well, involvement. Well, I, I was going I to ask about that. It, it's, Robert, did you say that, um, what, what was the percentage um, uh, on parent engagement, parent involvement? Uh, well, it, involving the a third of the respondents third. Uh, said uh, parent involvement was the key. Yeah. I think parent involvement in education, period, across the board, from birth to high school is important. And I don't think we do, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the public side, in government, is, is, I, I think there's, there's, there's some things that we do well in parent engagement in the early years. When we get to middle school, and certainly by the time a child is in high school, there's very little we can do, or the, the public sector can do. Um, but we have to start with that early. Now, I, I would agree, and I hear it all the time from uh, principals, teachers, superintendents, yeah, and I'm a parent, grandparent, and I say the same thing. It does make a difference. But you know what? We have children, many of whom in Louisiana are poor, many um, have single-parent households, a lot of barriers, a lot of challenges, and, and where there is an absence of parent involvement, we need to step up with a caring relationship, a mentor. We, there are substitutes. There are ways to overcome those barriers. So I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, uh, I mean, that's, a, that's the poll. I, I think a lot of folks answering that can perhaps use a little more information and education about the dropout problem in our state. I think the solution in the absence of parent involvement is that particularly for at-risk children, uh, we, th what we need are more caring relationships, more caring adults. It's a best practice. It's proven. It works. We've got guys in the audience right now with, um, with C the Year who can attest to it. It, it does work. So that, that, that would be my response. Early. But it, 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 it does early. have to start early. Mm -hmm. Parent engagement has to start early. And you talk about uh, people who care but, and who are involved. And I have with me Keith Corville. I hope I pronounced your name yes, uh, correctly. You are a doctoral student at LSU. You used to teach high school. Mm -hmm. And you served as a mentor and, and tried yes, to intervene, right? What do you make of what you're hearing here tonight? Well, it's interesting because I think that there's you know, a certain level of rhetoric that's really missing a great cause and concern of myself and both my teaching experience and my current position. Okay, and speak to that. Well, certainly. One of the things I do is I'm a director at a statewide nonprofit, Apple Associated Professional Educators Louisiana, and I'm director of professional development and university programs. I essentially travel the state and help train teachers, prepare teachers for a lot of different instructional shifts, changes in evaluation procedure, etc. And I'll give you an example. I was traveling to one of the best elementary schools in the state, and that's Mermintal Elementary by Mr. Melvin Smith. He's the principal over there and is a great person. Mm -hmm. That whole community is essentially built around that elementary school. But if you start traveling to other rural schools, you'll notice that the community is in decline. And I see a lot of rhetoric tonight about programs, policies, etc. but there's never anything specific for rural. And rural poverty is, quite frankly, very different from urban poverty. 
Could you address what your programs, especially Mr. Bradford's, um, Ms. Bradford worked with the Louisiana Virtual School right. and now is on course choice and very optimistic about that. And then Mr. John would educate now. What are nonprofits? What is the government doing for those rural schools? Because they need help. Very important uh, subject to bring up. Ken, we'll start with you. Certainly. Let's, let's start with, uh, as you alluded to, the state virtual school. Um, to get a top scholarship in Louisiana and to meet some of the diploma pathway graduation requirements, you need two years of foreign language. And I think this is a good example right here to start with. So the Department of Education, in partnership with the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and Arts in Natchitoches, years ago said there's a need for foreign language. And some of these rural schools in the state, they, they just couldn't fund a teacher that could come into this K-12 school where there was five or six seniors so that they could take a Spanish course to, to either graduate on their, on their current diploma pathway or to get a top scholarship or a top tech scholarship, whatever it was they needed. So distance learning when it started um, it was mainly focused on the foreign language. And through distance learning what has happened is today there's more than 2,500 students in the state, in, a lot of them in north and central Louisiana that are at rural schools and through technology, the medium of technology, they're now having access to this full menu of courses and it's been done through the state virtual school and it's had demonstrated positive results. As a matter of fact, it's not uncommon for students that take online foreign language courses, online advanced placement courses and online math courses that they'll go to the state rally at LSU at the end of the year and they'll finish in the top two or three. So it's working and it's customized because in those schools otherwise students wouldn't have access to it. John, you also directed that question well, to you. Well, just that uh, through, again, through Louisiana's Promise, uh, we've assisted 12 school districts and we continue to reach out to districts to offer the support to get the community engaged. And at least half of those districts uh, really are small rural districts. And, um, and so I'm, I, I appreciate your, uh, your, your question and concern, and, and I share it. Uh, I, I hear about their challenges all the time. I was, uh, in, in fact, meeting with a superintendent today um, who's, who would love to see the dropout rate, the graduation rate increase, but she's got limited resources. Um, and there's, a, there's another major challenge that many of our rural districts face. Uh, and I speak to our state leaders about this oftentimes, is um, retaining and, and keeping qualified teachers because we, we, we know how critical that is um, to learning and to, to a child's success. And, and I, I, I hear it all the time um, that uh, they they're constantly, uh, you know, faced with this challenge of, of trying to attract uh, teachers uh, uh, into a community and then keeping them there at the salary uh, that, that you know they're able to afford to, uh, afford to pay them, given all the competition they have uh, in those communities an for important, resources. An important uh, subject to matter, yeah. and I'm glad that you did bring it up. Thank you so much, Keith. And yeah. we're going to go over to Robert, who has someone else who is on the front line, a parent, Robert, a parent, or and a teacher yeah. also. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Deborah yeah. Anderson. Yes. Where are you a teacher, Deborah? I'm a teacher in Baton Rouge at an alternative school. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very familiar with the conversation of um, dropping out. And know. tell us, tell it, make sure everyone understands what is an alternative school. An alternative school is a setting where um, at-risk students have been placed there um, because of violation at their present home school. Right. And so our job is very tedious, and I'm very mm -hmm. familiar with the um, the at-risk situations. Mm -hmm. And um, Recently, however, it hit home. The dropout has hit home with me personally in my home. My child, who is a talented and gifted student, had the conversation very serious, and he has mapped out, I don't need this because of this, and I don't need this because of this. So, so your child almost dropped out or wanted to drop out? The conversation came up. I see. And, um, and it was a very valid conversation because what's going on is with the talented and gifted students in schools, I've observed that there are some students that are overwhelmed with other curriculum. And I know we talk about the online E2020, but what about the child that's into the music? You know, you, it's very limited with online. So Deborah, you, mm -hmm. you're both dealing with this at home and uh, at school. Now, do you have a question for uh, the panelists yes. along these this lines? This is the question. How do we accommodate the gifted and talented student who, has, who does not see the need for his present educational track? 
I, I think we've, it, it's been brought up multiple times today, and we've heard. It, it, it's starting early, and it, it's, it's finding that spark, identifying that spark for that student, and pro, ha, making sure that the schools and the counselors, they, they have, and the teachers, they, they have the tools and the resources, because those, the, those are the individuals that are, that are closest to these students, the parents, the teachers, the counselors, the principals. Make sure they have the right resources and the right tools to find that spark for that student. And, and once they find it, if there's a gap in the spark, being able to find that resource so that that student can stay on that pathway. You know, for instance, um, as, as another example of, of another policy shift that, that's taking place is the, the assessments and the, and the testing series. You know, there's going to be um, statewide testing of the ACT series, and students will be taking the Explore which will help them early on uh, identify academic risks and then they'll be taking the plan test ACT test, test series which will help them identify college and career uh, readiness pathways and then the ACT test so it's, it's providing those tools as well as things like we alluded to earlier the individual graduation plan which is done in the eighth grade amongst the parent the principal, the counselor, and the student, and identifying those pathways and staying on it. But as you alluded to, if you have that gifted and talented student, we want to make sure that the gifted and talented student has access to those courses that they need. And if it's, if it's not an advanced place in our dual enrollment, but it's a music course, where can we go to get that course offering for them? Is it a, is it, is it a some, some sort of symphonic program that they're participating in and getting their music d delivered to them in, in that format that, that engages them? And, and again, that calls it bringing in the community. Is, is there something in the community or in the business arena that might be able to offer a course offering in which a, a gifted student would want to go down that path and That's take it? That's great. Advice? I know Mr. Monahan wants to jump in. Just, just less than one minute. Less than one less minute. Than go, one go minute. After, yes. I think the answer to the question is not that every child's out there waiting to hear the good news that more tests are coming. Uh, a teacher spends within three, uh, uh, just documented in a, in a Washington Post story today, was that a teacher chronicled how much time spent in three weeks preparing for tests, 378 minutes. A child expects to be taught and engaged. If the object in the goal is to test, we've lost. So it's not the new tests that are going to change this in climate. And I think the folks that are walking away from public education and moving into private are demonstrating that they are not necessarily in love with tests. They're in love with the opportunity for their child to be taught as a child. Thanks, Mr. Monahan. I feel like we're just getting well. I feel like we're just getting warmed up, and I, it's it's always good to leave them wanting more. But unfortunately, we are out of time for our program uh, this evening. Wow. So uh, I want to thank our panelists, Mr. Bradford, Dr. Gouin, uh, Mr. Monahan and my friend Mr. Smith uh, for sh sharing your expertise uh, on tonight's topic. And we encourage you to visit our website at www.lpb.org slash public square. And while you're there, take this month's survey and comment on tonight's show. And we'd love to hear from you. Well, thanks again to our studio audience. Y'all are absolutely uh, terrific. We really appreciate it. And tune in next month uh, where our show will be bullying in Louisiana on Louisiana Public Square. Until then, good night. Thanks for joining us. Everybody give yourselves a round of applause. You did excellent. Great. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.